I've never really thought of myself as an artist, and I start with the practical part. Even if it's an impractical design, you still it has to be executed in some practical way in order for it to even work. So that's where I've always started is with how it's going to do what it's going to do, and then at the very last, what it's going to look like. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, fellow Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 72 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn everything about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, and anyone who loves knives. And we've got another great interview episode coming up for you today on this show. But first, Bob, we want to get to a couple of listener line messages, thanks to some listeners who called in. And unfortunately, we weren't able to get these in during our uh, midweek supplemental issue that came out on Christmas Day because we had to record that a couple of days early. So we right. missed a uh, missed a message from uh, Charlie the Lefty that we received on Christmas Eve, as well as uh, one of our oldest listeners, Cabin Man. Yep. Yeah, actually, both uh, Cabin Man and Charlie have been around since uh, pretty much the very beginning. And Cabin Man was the first man uh, who ever reached out to the podcast. So it's right. great to finally hear his voice after a year of corresponding uh, via Instagram. And one of the things uh, Cabin Man did leave on his message, and I know he's told you before, is the listener line is, we're not sitting there waiting to answer it, so it's a recording. So uh, <laughs> you'll get you'll get a, a greeting and for you to leave your message. So uh, when you hear the beep and you hear our stuff, uh, you can just uh, go ahead and leave a message. But uh, Charlie the Lefty did on Christmas Eve, so what do you say we give a listen to what he had uh, on his wish list for Christmas? Let's do it. Hey, this is Charlie the Lefty. I've been listening to the uh, Nice Chunky Podcast. Just about since you started, really enjoy it. A um, couple things I was look forward to for Christmas would be the um, one that I actually got coming that I ordered on Black Friday. That's the Micro Evo from Brian Nadeau in lefty form, of course. And uh, on a cheaper note, I think that CRKT Minimalist, the new one that Alan Foltz designed, that has a, like a gear pattern on the blade and the uh, Glow in the dark handles. I think that'd be pretty awesome to get for Christmas. Other than that, I've been collecting for a long time, and uh, I don't have any ambitions for any other knives right now. You know, being left-handed is hard. <laughs> anyway, appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Charlie, and a very happy New Year to you. May it be uh, prosperous, uh, filled with love, and filled with new knives. Lots of new knives. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of new knives. <laughs> also, good to hear your voice, Charlie. After uh, after a while, so yeah. Well, as you said, uh, good to hear the voice of Cabin Man. We uh, actually, on the uh, Christmas Day supplemental, read a, uh, I think it was a, what, IG, Instagram message that he had yeah. sent you that yeah. we got in on the show. About his most carried knife of uh, 19, yeah, that's uh, right. that's 2019. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, let's hear what uh, Cabin Man has to say this time. Hey, guys, uh, this Cabin Man, Mike Cervantes, I... It said uh, that y'all weren't available, but it did beep and tell me to leave a message. So if y'all get this from Cold Steel, I would love to see in 2020 their version of the uh, Yojimbo or the Yojumbo, the new one coming out, or their version of the um, Artisan Cutlery Proponent. Love those knives. I'm, I'm love the look of them. I should say I'm getting in. The proponent and uh, looking forward to uh, playing with. I mean, uh, working on it. Talk to y'all later. Happy New Year and uh, love the work. Keep it up. Bye. So that kind of sounds similar to uh, my idea of the uh, Recon One with the uh, with the sax blade. Kind of the same sort of neighborhood. I think uh, Cabin Man. I think you and I are are kind of uh, in in the same sort of blade mood. That sort of sax and sort of Warncliffe thing. Let's see some of that from Cold Steel. Kindred spirits, if you will, the, the <laughs> knife junkie and the cabin man. That's right. Well, and thanks, cabin man, and thanks, Charlie the Lefty, for uh, leaving our listener line messages. We uh, we made a promise on the Christmas Day show that, uh, or Bob 
ask to put me to work <laughs> to have you call the listener line and leave a message or multiple messages so I'd have more editing work to do. But glad to do it. We want to hear from you. We want to get your voice involved. So if you would like to be a part of the Knife Junkie podcast, call and leave your recorded message, comment, thought, whatever you would like to say. Promote your website. Promote your uh, knife company if you have one. Promote your Instagram, your YouTube channel, whatever. But call us at 724 724- 466-4487. That number again, 724-466-4487. And leave us your comments on the listener line. Bob, a uh, great interview coming up today. Mm-hmm. Uh, father and son, actually, that are in the knife business. Yeah, that's right. This episode, uh, I speak with Grant and Gavin Hawk. Uh, they're acclaimed designers and innovators and makers of uh, folding knives, mostly, and you know them from the mud folder or the deadlock out the front. That's whew, that's amazing. But anyway, uh, they're out of Idaho City, and it was really great to talk to them. It's a father and son team, and uh, very interesting to get the insights uh, from those two generations. What do you say we get to that interview right after this? Because I do want to let you know that our podcast today is brought to you by QuickBooks Online. They can take managing your small business finances to the next level, which will allow you to focus on growing your business, not working on the books. Use this special link and get 50% off your subscription, theknifejunkie.com slash QuickBooks. You can get 50% off your subscription on either QuickBooks Online or QuickBooks Self-Employed for the first six months of either product. So get started with QuickBooks Self-Employed or QuickBooks Online today. Small business owners who have a to-do list that never quits need QuickBooks. If you're looking to simplify your business finances and your life, then check out QuickBooks Self-Employed and QuickBooks Online at a special discounted rate, theknifejunkie.com slash QuickBooks. Subscribe to the Knife Junkie's YouTube channel at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. I'm here with acclaimed pocket knife innovators. Grant and Gavin Hawk. It is an honor and a pleasure to speak to you, gentlemen. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So I was digging around, trying to find out a little bit about you, and I came across uh, two very well-produced videos, and I watched them and was taken in by your story. You have an interesting story. Besides producing incredibly interesting and innovative knives, there's sort of an innovative, or uh, there's sort of an interesting backstory. Explain how gold prospecting and being out in Idaho led to your knife-making career. Uh, well, that might be a question for me. I came to Idaho City in 76. I'd already been prospecting around the country some. This is a mining district, and I was familiar with it from a, working on a ranch here when I was a kid. And so I came back to this area and, and started looking at mining ground, taking up claims. And little by little, I became more deeply involved in mining things. I invented some mining equipment and got this shop, the building that we're in now in 88, and was making mining equipment and dealing with some uh, a drilling project about a hundred miles from here in another mining district. And things were uh, going pretty well, but in the early 90s, the price of precious metals fell, Hmm. and nobody wanted my mining equipment anymore or mining claims. Most of our mining issues died down. I was working with Canadian juniors by then, locating claims uh, and prospective drill targets that mining companies would be interested in. Anyway, everything kind of fell apart. And Gavin was young then, and I had custody, and he was in school, and so I was trying to figure out a way to make a living uh, without going all over the country. I'd worked quite a bit in Alaska as well. And so I dabbled around trying to figure out something to do, and I guess Thumbing through a knife magazine made me wonder I couldn't possibly make a knife. And so at some point, I took Gavin with me, and we went to the Eugene show and spent the three days there walking around and talking to knife makers and one thing another. And on the drive home, we talked about it, 
and it seemed like that was an arena that we might be able to function in. So when we got back, I started making a few prototypes to get a feel for it. I introduced myself to Chris Reeve, who happened to be in the Boise phone book 40 miles away. So I drove to Boise and met with Chris Reeve and told him I wanted to be a knife maker. And Chris says, yeah, well, everybody wants to be a knife maker. <laughs> and he said, have you ever made a knife? And I said, well, no. So he said, well, go make a knife and bring it back and show it to me. So I did that. And when I brought it back, uh, he looked it all over and he said, that's the worst knife I've ever seen. And so I went back and tried some more and little by little, I kept bringing him knives. And finally, uh, I think he kind of weakened a little bit and started <laughs> helping me and gave me a little demonstration of how to grind bevels and a few things like that. But we've had a long history with Chris Reeve and mm -hmm. uh, he used to heat treat our knives when he was doing his own heat treat. But anyway, that kind of got us started. And then when Gavin was, I'm not sure, maybe 13 or 14, he started, uh, well, he was helping in the shop already after school and then uh, helped him design a fixed blade, um, which uh, worked out well for him. And he took his knives to school. He sold them to his, his uh, principal, bought one, and his math teacher bought one. The good old days in God's yeah. country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't get away with that anymore, I don't think. <laughs> but we're a small town, and, and so it works out here okay. But anyway, so Gavin started making knives as well, and then as he got older, he, well, we started working together more and mm -hmm. so on. So that's kind of how we got started. Well, uh, something s struck me, and that's that uh, when you were in the mining industry, you were known and successful for being an innovator and creating something new for that industry. And uh, since you've come to the knife industry, that's what you've been known for as well. I mean, every time a new knife comes out uh, from the pair of you, there seems to be some sort of innovation involved. Looking at your looking at your workspace, it kind of looks like the space of an inventor or a fine artist, and and less of a a a metal shop. That's true. Uh, yeah, and as a matter of fact, the first knife that probably really put us on the map was the ET, which is a toggle link mechanism. That design and a few others patterned after it depended on a toggle lock mechanism. The idea for that came from mining equipment, not my design, but mm -hmm. traditional jaw crushers. I realized how much pressure that it, uh, well, there's a, some unique characteristics about toggle lock mechanism, uh, but it works well in rock crushers. It also works in closing injection mold dies and one thing or another. And that you have a lot of travel, um, but the actual or the highest force is applied at the very last moment of its travel. And that actually led to the development of uh, the ET. Uh, first, we did what we called the toad, which was a uh, toggle lock mechanism, but contained within the handle. And then after that, we developed the ET, which was an external toggle, which is what ET stands for. So these were your first uh, real folding knife innovations. That's right, yeah. So, uh, Gavin, how old were you at this time, and, and what kind of role did you play in developing these innovations? I didn't really start helping with the designs until the ET, uh, mm -hmm. and even that was somewhat minor. I was mainly just bouncing ideas around, and a couple of them stuck. And, and made it into the final version. But the knives before that, which would have been, well, let's see, there was the pony knife, which I wasn't really involved with, and then the dog lock, which is the one mm -hmm. I was first involved with as far as making it. And so uh, I was grinding the bevels and doing a lot of the finish work and assembly. 
Um, and then that carried on into the toad. I pretty much made most of the parts in the toad, uh, especially the lathe parts. And then, and then, yeah, then the ET came along and that's when I, that's when our logo changed, uh, from GW Hawk to G and G Hawk, uh, GW Hawk standing, or uh, which was my dad's initials mm-hmm. and then G and G Hawk for Grant and Gavin Hawk. That's cool. So as a, as a young, as a young person interested in knives and kind of doing the, the journeyman side of things, you know, doing, doing the hard work, if you will, did that, uh, did actually laying your hands on the, the metal and doing the grinding and doing all that stuff, did that sort of lead to, to a, to a necessity that led to these innovations? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, well, let's, let's, let's look at, uh, at, at some of these unique. I mean, you're not just innovating to do different and interesting things. You're, you're solving a problem with each knife, I would imagine. So how do you go about that? So we used to play this game at coffee shops or in the car. And, and it would be essentially, what if a knife did this? And we would start with a long list of some totally impossible ideas and some that were, uh, almost practical. Just doing this brainstorming game, we'd eventually come up with something that we both thought could actually turn into a product. And then, and then there would be a design stage after that. Maybe if we're in the coffee shop, we might start penciling out some rough sketches uh, and then, and then kind of move from there. So it was most of the designs, uh, up until the deadlock were really just kind of out of the blue. Like, we weren't trying to solve a specific problem. We were just trying to come up with something interesting and unique and then figure out a way to make it. And yeah, it generally had some type of advantage to it. But then the interesting thing about the deadlock is it's the first design where we almost just took the challenge up of solving a known problem <laughs> uh, because everybody knew that uh, OTFs had blade play a lot of people had tried to invent mechanisms to take out blade play, but nobody ever really did it. All uh, right. And so we thought, okay, well, we can do that. And so we took up that that challenge. But yeah, before that, all of the, the ideas were essentially just out of left field, which is one of the reasons that the, the deadlock, we think, has been so successful uh, is because you don't have to explain it to people. All, all right, of our other designs, right. it was, you know, they'd come to our table uh, and they're expecting liner locks or frame locks or, or something like that. But we've got this wacky contraption and most of the show is spent saying, OK, well, this this lever here moves and then this falls into place and then this does this. Here you try. Whereas with the deadlock, you just hand them the deadlock and they already know how it works. They understand the mm-hmm. principle. And there's no real explanation of how it works. So forgive me because I've never held or used one, but did you solve the problem? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Interesting. So, so it's a totally different design than any other double action out the front I might have encountered. Correct. And essentially what we did with the deadlock is there's two somewhat separate mechanisms, or I guess three. Uh, one of them being the launching mechanism, which is fairly, uh, comparable to other mechanisms. We've made some improvements on it, but nothing out of the ordinary, um, or earth shattering. But then the other part is it has a wedge system that it flies into. And that wedge system is actually what takes out the blade play. And then it has a lock that keeps it into the wedge system. And so that, that was the big trick. So everybody else was trying to figure out how to just lock it in multiple ways or add extra locks. But, uh, instead what we did is we, we wedge it and then hold it into position. Not actually knowing how it works intuitively. It seems like a wedge is the way to go because, uh, you know, as long as you keep the pressure sort of increasing, which you might with a spring, you know, you're always going to have it at the, at the sort of outside of its, tolerance or something right and 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 that is the nice thing about the wedge is that it it kind of once it hits it just seats itself into position tightens everything up and then 
before it can fall back out of the wedge, the lock just engages and holds it there. So the mud, the mud flipper, that was solving a problem, was it not? That was like, that was solving the issue of grit and grime getting in, in the action, right? And that's true, except that it wasn't, uh, I guess I could have rephrased it, but it it wasn't a known um, problem or it wasn't something that people were actively trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And so that was more of us saying, well, what if uh, you could throw your knife in the mud and it wouldn't get dirt inside of it? Yeah. And then and then solving that problem versus, again, the deadlock, it was this urban legend of, you know, <laughs> So and so's dead, you know, knife locks up solid, and inevitably you'd go play with it, and it'd have blade play in it, and and then people would even the common answer was, well, you have to have blade play in an OTF, otherwise it won't work, uh, and so people had almost just given up on on trying to accomplish that goal. All right. So I I find that knife to be particularly beautiful. I love the symmetry of a dagger. Uh, I love out the fronts. I love uh, I love any any sort of folding or mechanical dagger. Uh, you know I'm 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 in already. But uh, that's a particularly uh, beautiful one, and uh, it uses a an interesting clip. You uh, you gentlemen are known for innovating clips as well. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so the, the original goal was to develop a clip that didn't tear up your pants, was easy to get in and out, but yet it stayed in the pocket. And actually, our first attempt at that on the RAM was a clip that had a ratcheting roller. So the uh, on the tip of the clip, there was a little wheel, and it would roll really easy into your pocket, but then the ratchet would lock and the, and the wheel wouldn't roll coming out. And in that, the way you'd get it out is you'd grab the tip of the clip and just kind of lift up on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that worked really well, except it was, I don't know, a little overcomplicated. And we figured out a better way, uh, which accomplished all of the same objectives, which was the grip clip, uh, which is essentially kind of like having a clothespin attached to the to the knife so now when you squeeze the clip it lifts the tip all the way up you can slide it into your pocket it's not rubbing over the lip of the pocket yeah. um and then and then when you let go of it it grips the pocket securely with quite a bit of string spring force more than you would want in a regular clip because mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to get it back out uh but in this case you squeeze the clip again and and now you can pull it easily out of your pocket. The other nice advantage uh, is that you get a little bit stronger clip because, uh, especially on the um, the clip, like on, say on the deadlock, uh, where it's a solid machined clip with some uh, compression springs hiding under it. So so the body of the clip itself, since we're not trying to make that a spring. We can make it really heavy and thick so that wow. if you do catch it, it's not going to tweak or bend the clip. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the, a pocket clip has to have some uh, springiness to it. And to have that springiness, you have to have some relief cut in it, which then makes it inherently weak. Well, that, that concept of working on making a clip that doesn't absolutely mangle your clothes is kind of an interesting and modern problem, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But it, but it's it is one. I mean, those of us who've been carrying knives, you know, we we all have those genes that have sort of expired before their time because the pockets are just unsightly, you know. Right. And, and the other problem is that uh, it's not always easy to start the clip into the knife into the the pocket. Uh, so depending on the type of pants you're wearing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can't even hardly do it one-handed. You almost have to grab your pants and hold the mm -hmm. uh, the seam of the pants there, or the lip of the pant uh, pocket, tight, so that you can force the clip to go over that the, the seam there. Whereas with the grip clip, you just put the knife in your pocket, squeeze it, it uh, easily slides over and goes into your pocket. Yeah, it doesn't take much. I mean, you just uh, just in terms of you know when I have a new knife or a new pair of pants and I'm I'm kind of pulling up on the clip. 
it's uncomfortable, especially with uh, sculpted titanium clips, you know, that are so stiff. But right. I guess you, you deal with that uh, that little ounce of pain. But to have a clip that addresses that is pretty innovative. So, so to me, something that's really interesting is the two generations making these knives. Grant, how does working with your son help you in innovating? How does the, the intergenerational uh, sort of play kind of uh, create these interesting knives? Yeah, well, and so I guess we're bouncing ideas uh, coming from uh, a different eras. It helps a lot to just have someone that you can communicate with and uh, and has an understanding of basic mechanical principles and also an understanding somewhat of the knife industry and what what buyers want. I think I think uh, an event that made an impression on me at least was when we went to that first show in Eugene, Oregon. There were some people there with a very special knife. I don't remember the names of anything. I've never seen it before or since. But there was a, a, a single knife there that some people had brought from Germany. And I don't think they were, they weren't like selling from a stockpile of these knives. There was only one. And it had a big drawing on the back behind their booth of how the knife worked. And it worked in the most impractical possible way, but in an interesting way. So to open this knife, you had to remove a, a crank handle that was spring-loaded uh, in a pocket in the handle. And then you insert the handle into a hole near the axis of the blade pivot. And you turn the handle, and at turning that handle would crank the knife from <laughs> That's awesome. closed to open. It was totally impractical, but there was a crowd around this table, and the price on the knife was over ten thousand dollars. Wow! And I was impressed with the fact with the fact that the knife was totally impractical, yet it drew so much attention because it was so different. And the mechanism was a worm gear, uh, which is something used in winches and one thing or another. And that is, it'll, it'll stay any place you put it. When you stop cranking, that's where the blade is. And it's mm -hmm. perpetually locked at every single step of the way from close to open and open to close. Oh, wow. Anyway, that seemed to say to me that it didn't necessarily have to be practical, but it did have to be interesting. And so that was kind of the framework that I developed the whole perspective towards the knife world. There were people doing marvelous things that I knew I personally wasn't capable of uh, with uh, fancy engraving and, I don't know, mm -hmm. scrimshaw and some wonderful knives made by wonderful people, made a lot of interesting people. But... I was trying to find something that I thought I could do in the beginning. And that was the thing, that was the niche that I thought I might be best able to exploit. And that is very unusual ways of getting there, mm -hmm. uh, practical or not. And so that was kind of the start of working outside the box, so to speak, and studying other mechanisms and other technologies for ways that could be applied in some uh, unique way to knives. So that was kind of the start of it. And then when we both got into the spirit of it, we, again, like Gavin said, we, uh, we spent a lot of time in between everything else we had to do, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, just dreaming up stuff that may have been impossible, but trying to make it possible. And through that, we developed a whole bunch of uh, knife designs that attracted a certain following just because of the uniqueness of it. And that's kind of what we relied on for a long time. Interesting thing to me is that all of this uniqueness, none of it really seems gratuitous to me. None of it seems like gimmicky, which 
for an outfit that puts out, you know, a range of knives and each thing has an innovation. It's kind of, uh, unique not to have it feel gimmicky, but each, each time, uh, each design I've seen of yours seems to make sense. You know, it seems to have an internal logic, I guess is, is the mm-hmm. point. So Grant, when you were a young man and first getting into the idea of knives where did you see the knife world going and as compared to where it is and what you've uh, done within it well you you said grant and i I guess that's who you mean but yeah you i I didn't (laughs) i didn't pay any attention to knives until i was looking around for something to do uh as a young guy i carried a knife i i was raised on a cattle ranch Mm. and uh, mostly we just had pocket knives uh, for hunting. We would take along uh, a, a knife of some kind to dress game with. And we didn't, on a ranch in the mountains, we were already amongst deer and elk. And so rather, we didn't really have hunting trips. It's just that when hunting season rolled around, we'd tie a rifle, a rifle scabbard on our saddle so that we're uh, ready. And then just during the course of the usual chores, uh, we'd oftentimes see game. And if the timing was right, well, we might take that game. And then, of course, you have a knife to deal with it, part of the solution to that. Right. But I never really, I've never really been a knife aficionado. I never, it never occurred to me to collect knives. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd always had a knife for years. Uh, I just carried a buck 110 on a belt sheet. Uh, I did uh, a lot of projects in the realm of construction and one thing or another, and uh, and outdoors a good part of my life. But I always had a knife, but I never fantasized about right. making a knife. Yeah, and so he was about 55-ish, 54 when... Started making knives. Yeah, I guess oh, really? so. Yeah, pretty yeah. close to that. Something I think, Gavin, you mentioned in one of the videos I watched in in researching you is that you create these very very modern knives out of a very rustic space, and uh, it's it's kind of an interesting. Uh, you know, you don't expect it. You kind of expect you gentlemen to be working in a, a sort of pristine, brightly lit lab. You know. <laughs> When yeah, in reality, it, it, it looks stove. like a tinkerer's shop. It's so cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. It is. And in a lot of ways, we're we're more inventors than than knife makers, anyways. And so, uh, yeah, our whole shop is set up for inventing things and hmm. coming up with ideas. Now, that's that was how it used to be. Uh, we've we've since kind of changed our business model. Uh, not that we won't keep coming up with ideas, but. Uh, we've really been focused on the deadlock, mm-hmm. and because of the popularity and the de- uh, just the demand, we've uh, remodeled our shop uh, more for production. We've hired employees and uh, bought new machines, and so we're kind of going going in this new direction of just manufacturing high end knives in our shop. Oh, that's great, and your hands will be on on all of them. I, I'm assuming. All right, so I know that in innovation is a is a big part of it, or at least it's a big part of it for me. I keep mentioning it. But what about aesthetics for you guys? I mean, each one of your knives looks unique, and I, I, I wouldn't even say from one knife to the next that, well, I mean, there maybe there's a design language I haven't quite picked up on, but uh, each each design is unique and beautiful and mechanical, but uh, so... How much does uh, the look of the knife play into its development? It usually comes last. Uh, at least it always <laughs> has. Uh, uh, some of the some of the early knife designs that, uh, well, I probably came up with a deadlock in the beginning, and I don't know, maybe that. So I don't know. We kind of overlap there a little bit, but but I had made some contraptions here just by hand in the shop that was really just a three-dimensional study of the mechanism. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them barely look like a knife, 
um, but an opening mechanism uh, of one kind or the other, and usually mocked up with aluminum and brass, and oversized, and with no regard whatsoever to looks. Mm-hmm. I just try to study the mechanism, uh, determine what it was that was going to make it work or prevent it from working, try to take all the considerations into play, and then at the very last, we decided to move forward, then we would decide how it looks based partly, or maybe almost entirely, on uh, what the parameters of that particular mechanism was. Like if you, you need to have a place to put the mechanism, so there has to be room for it. There may be considerations as to how it works and how everything fits and folds up and goes out of sight and it can't be too big and too little and so on. And then at the very last, kind of draw a line around it and make it, uh, it will enclose all of that mechanism mm-hmm. that you're going to do. And then that's kind of what the knife looks like. And then maybe, I don't know, add some things, experiment with some of the variables and till finally deciding that yeah, this is the way we're going to go. But I've never really thought of myself as an artist, and I start with the practical part. Even if it's an impractical design, you still it has to be executed in some practical way in order for it to even work. So that's where I've always started, is with how it's going to do what it's going to do, and then at the very last, what it's going to look like. So you mentioned what it's going to do. How how much do you take into account what the end user might use it for? Or uh, how much do you design a knife for a specific purpose? You know, I look at the deadlock and it's a wicked looking weapon to me. And to me, there's no weapon is not a bad word when talking about knives. It's sure. it's yet another reality when talking about knives. Um, of course, thank thank God, not anyone's prime reality or most people uh in any case but it is there and you look at a a dagger and you think wow that would be i'd like to have that you know uh uh, when i'm not feeling right out on the street you know so the dagger look of course is an old one and traditional and started with the romans probably grinding sharpening their swords on both sides i don't know uh and so it was easy to fall into that it's also easier with an out the front to be symmetrical, yes. which uh, isn't so easy with a knife that folds from the side. And so, uh, to me, it's almost entirely dictated by the mechanical parts, and then you have some flexibility with uh, the line you draw around the outside, but like the case of the deadlock, it couldn't be uh, one smidgen smaller because every bit of that space is used for something, either to hold it together or to store the parts. Uh, another thing that's unique about the deadlock is that we were the first to put the lock in the blade tang. So there's not a separate, there is a separate mechanism at both ends, but the lock itself actually travels with the blade tang oh. in the blade tang. And so that gives us a little more wiggle room on design because that's one less thing that has to be accounted for in the profile of the knife outside of the uh, uh, of the profile of the blade and the space that it takes up in its travel and and so on. So anyway, just kind of muddling through and blending all of those in as best we can and then trying to make it look right and trying to make it look interesting I don't know if we put a lot into that or not. I'm not sure. When it gets to where it works and the, it looks okay, then here we go. But I, I don't see myself, I don't think either one of us see ourselves as primarily artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're just guys who make things. I, I uh, To me, uh, the two knives that are popping into my mind are the mud and the deadlock. And, they, and they're both beautiful in their own way. And the the mud, uh, I'm thinking of the automatic, it looks so business-like that it's it's artful. And then the deadlock is so artful, it's it's business-like. Some, something about them, they're, they're both. And of course, like you mentioned, uh, with an out the front, you, you have an opportunity to deal in symmetry. And something about yep. that is so appealing. And, 
And uh, yeah, the shape of the handle is just uh, on that knife. It's very, it's very appealing to me. Oh well, good. Uh, yeah, and it it probably leans a lot towards the traditional look of uh, the dagger look. I don't know if there's too much innovation in the deadlock as far as the overall profile or design goes. It's just we just made it as small as we could and mm -hmm. still get everything in there, and then the lines to look okay. So what what kind of things are you looking at uh, for your next big knife? Is there a problem you're trying to solve, or is there an innovation you're um, – uh, you, you probably don't want to mention it if you're halfway through it, but <laughs> is there something you're working yeah, I don't on? I don't know if we have up? any secrets. We, uh, uh, things kind of go through stages. There's kind of a conceptual thought about how something might work, and so we have a lot of oh, preliminary drawings of – uh, mechanisms that we might exploit uh, in the future. I think we've kind of, for the moment at least, put all that on the back burner and want to make the wheels go around on this mm -hmm. deadlock that we're in the middle of. And as you probably know, we've worked with manufacturers on yeah. licensing agreements in the past on different things. And that's been a big help and it's worked well and uh, uh, but in this particular case, whenever, whenever you do that, whenever you have a collaboration with a company, mm -hmm. it starts off as a compromise with the two different interests of the two entities uh, as, a, uh, as makers and inventors and, uh, and then the perspective of the company that is going to make and manufacture and market it and so on. Mm -hmm. And so... We just decided that when we got to the deadlock and we realized there was sustainable demand, that we felt like we could probably weather the learning curves mm -hmm. uh, of developing that particular design into a workable production knife and keep it in-house just so that we don't, we're not sharing the, well, the authority really of of how it should be and how we want to market it and how we want it to look and so on. So, yeah. so we're yeah. comfortable with that. Our, our collaborations have been really good for us. It helped us a lot and it, it provided a steady stream of cash flow, uh, mm -hmm. during the years we were spinning our wheels and trying to make new designs, all of which doesn't really pay until you have a paying product. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, all that worked out really well, but, uh, we really like the idea of calling our own shots yes. now the way we're doing it. And and so the deadlock, we've been making that for four or five years now. And since we've been working on the deadlock, we haven't really come up with anything else innovative. And and so all the focus has been on the deadlock. But the deadlock itself uh, has gone through probably eight revisions hmm. internally. Uh, so even though it kind of looks the same on the outside, every batch that we were making, right. we completely re-engineered the inside. So while you're doing that, while you're while you continue to sort of evolve the deadlock, what what goes on with your other designs? Do you do you have those other tried and true designs in the hands of collaborators, or is that something that you wait to pull out at some point uh, for your your own shop to produce again? How does that work? Well, so a lot of it, uh, you know, it takes two or three years for a knife to really go from initial prototype to giving it to a manufacturer, then making their prototypes first runs and I don't know, all that stuff. And so right. we had kind of a cache of cache of, of knives that were already with manufacturers. And then we started working on the deadlock. So while we were working on the deadlock, we had designs coming out. But we weren't really doing anything else but working on the deadlock. And with that, we'd, we'd come up with, you know, 14 prototypes and then figure out all the issues while, you know, the assembly issues and manufacturing problems, redesign, remake, redesign, remake, until we got to a point where we're at now where we felt really comfortable with the internal designs and we kind of took everything into a new direction. So instead of spending more time 
evolving the deadlock. We're satisfied with it. And now we're going, we're focusing in that, that manufacturing direction. Right. And the goal we'd really like to get, or at least I'd like to get, is a point where we have talented uh, employees that can kind of take the reins and <laughs> and make the knives, and then we can go back to inventing and creating new things that we can then launch in our own knife company, and again have full control over you know, materials and specs and and everything. And, and just kind of build ourselves that direction. But right now you're expanding your capacity with your own means of production. That, I think that's a, that's a, a, an important step to be taking, right? Correct. Yeah. So yeah. once we can kind of, uh, get a strong foundation under us of, uh, of the deadlock just being produced every month, everybody knows what to do. We've got all the systems in place. Then we can branch off of that and introduce new inventive concepts. Is the technology that you developed for the deadlock something that you would license to other makers? Seems like a problem solved that's been around a long time. We've, we've briefly talked about it with other custom knife makers on a very limited scale, mm -hmm. uh, although nothing has really come to fruitation yet. Uh, as far as licensing, of course, to a, a manufacturer or, or any large scale stuff, uh, we've, we've decided not to do that at all. But, uh, it's not out of the question to do a small run with another custom guy. But it actually, yeah, I mean, for your, your plans to ramp up your own manufacturing, it makes sense to just keep that, keep that little baby to yourself and, keep pumping them out and, and, and expand what you can do. Right. I got to say, uh, someone that I love online is uh, Advanced Knife Bro, and he absolutely loves the mud flipper, and I keep coming back to that. Uh, I know I'm a, I, I'm a dagger guy, and I'm an out-the-front guy lately, but uh, that, that mud flipper, I just keep coming back to it. So are there any, uh, any plans uh, in, the, in the near future to, to get anything out? that uh, your your average guy can, can get his hands on? Uh, we've been talking about it. Uh, we're, we're hoping, like I said, we can get this deadlock kind of just humming, and, and every month we're, we're able to put knives out the door, uh -huh. uh, just get a nice system going, and then at that point we'll, we'll probably reintroduce something, either the manual mud or the mud auto, maybe the orbit, uh, and, and start bringing some of those back online. Great. Well, Grant and Gavin Hawk, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie oh, podcast. Yeah. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and finding out uh, kind of where these spectacular knives come from and, and who they come from. So it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. thank you so much for, thank having, you for having us. Thank you for having us. Definitely. You know you're a knife junkie if you plan your vacation around the next Knife Expo. Okay, back on episode number 72 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Great conversation, Bob, with Grant yeah. and Gavin Hawk, father and son. Uh, I don't know that we've ever had a father and son on before. Uh, we've, we've had brothers. Um, right. And we've had husband and wife, or a couple. And, uh, yeah, so we've had a few, few of those, but, few, uh, few. anyway, never father and son. Yeah. Interesting, interesting dynamic. Yeah, really. And, and, uh, you know, I, I just love the generational interplay and just how, um, the experience of, of, of Grant in machining and the youth of Gavin, not that he's youth, but, uh, you know, that the young nature and the older nature and the, and the technical and the design coming together, it, it just seems, uh, a very harmonious uh, artistic partnership. I, I don't mm -hmm. know what else to say. It's. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they have it down. And I love the. If if you haven't seen uh, the video they have on their website of them in their workspace, you have to check it out. Their workspace looks like a fine artist, like a painter's, like a Picasso barn or something. It's got a real. I don't know. Romantic look to it. I, I love it <laughs> for a workspace. I don't know. You know. <laughs> okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, these guys are great, and I and I love how. Uh, how they work together and, and complement one another's strengths. Well, you mentioned their website. That's hawknifedesigns.com, hawknifedesigns.com. We'll have a link on the uh, show notes page at uh, thenifejunkie.com slash 72. 
where you can find that link and uh, more on this episode. And you can actually listen to that episode right on the Knife Junkie webpage at thenifejunkie.com slash 72. I want to remind you that we'll be back on Wednesday with our midweek supplemental issue. And don't forget Thursday night. It's Thursday Night Knives at 10 p.m. Eastern. Bob uh, and I took off the week of Christmas from Thursday Night Knives, but not the podcast. So uh, we'll be back on audio on Wednesday and video on Thursday, Bob. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I can't wait to get my face back in front of that camera. Oh, boy. I'll let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's going to do it for Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.